Today we continue in the sermon series, The Journey Back to Love, which started on Ash Wednesday, and I invite you to um, see the words of that sermon or hear that sermon at some point and to get into the spirit of this full journey until we reach Easter. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Gary Charles tells the story of a young woman interviewing him for a paper she was writing on world religions. After going through many questions, questions like, how does your denomination understand God? And who is Jesus for you? And does your church believe in heaven and hell? The young student came to her final question. What is the central message of your faith? Gary answered each question as best he could, and like anyone in that situation, found himself later thinking about answers he could have given. But that final question stuck with him long after she left. In fact, that question never left him. He couldn't shake it. It just held on to him. What is the central message of our faith? Think about that. What is the central message of your faith? Perhaps the best answer to this question can be found in our text from Mark 1, 9 through 15. Still dripping wet from his baptism in the Jordan River with John there, Jesus is still holding on to the loving word of God from heaven. He is driven into the wilderness by the same spirit that was present at his baptism. There for 40 days, he's tempted by Satan, protected by wild beasts, and attended by angels. Now wet with sweat, now exhausted from his fasting, he exits his wilderness encounter and speaks his first words of public ministry, words that point us to an answer, what is the central question, what is the central meaning of your faith? Jesus says, repent and believe in the good news. God has been unleashed and is now on the loose in the person of Jesus. In these words of Jesus, there is no distant hope, no otherworldly predictions, no proclamations of things yet to come. Things are going to change now. We must brace ourselves for what is coming now. What is coming now is metanoia. And metanoia, repentance, is everything. Metanoia is a word that is shouted, not whispered, although what happens in its path can often come as a whisper from God into your ear and into your heart. It is a word full of meaning. It is a word that will take us to the central meaning of our faith. It has two primary meanings. It is a word that will lead us through the Hebrew scriptures to the Christian scriptures. In the Hebrew scriptures, metanoia means to turn or to return, to turn or to return. It directly relates to, the ancient, to ancient Israel's exile in Babylon and their return home. It literally means to embark on a journey of return to your homeland, to the Holy Land where God is found. But in this journey, you're not only traveling to the place where God is found, you are traveling with God in your return. The entire journey is embraced by God, leads back to God, and the experience is metanoia. But there's another meaning which comes alive in the Christian scriptures, beginning right here in Mark 1 in the 14th verse. It means to go beyond the mind we have, to go beyond the mind we have. This phrase is both evocative and provocative. The mind we have is acquired 
from our socialization experiences of time, of people, of place, of family, of all the things that sort of make us up, all the enculturated ways in which we're shaped by people and places, everything in our thinking and in our actions, what we read, what we sing, what we hear, all of that has to do in shaping, according to our faith, the mind we have. To go beyond the mind we have means to see and act in new ways, a new way shaped by God decisively in Jesus for us. This is repentance. Although the Bible speaks of repenting of our sins, the emphasis throughout Scripture is not so much on contrition and sorrow and guilt. It is on turning from them and returning to God. Repentance is about change. It is not primarily a prerequisite for forgiveness, though that may come. It is about change. While that may shock some of you, it is the truth. Repentance is about returning. It's about turning around. It's about making that turn with God, not just to God. It is about a new mindset. It is about everything shifting. And what is the new way that the gospel is calling us to? What do we see when we turn around? We see love. That's right. When we turn around, we see love. We see the face of God. And the face of God is love. It was love that called Jesus from the carpenter's bench to the Sea of Galilee and down into the waters of baptism in the Jordan River with John. It was love that comes from the voice of God. You are my son, whom I love. It is love that pushes the Holy Spirit to push Jesus out of the water and into the wilderness. It is love that battles there in the wilderness with the presence of Satan. It is love that gathers the wild beast to stand beside Jesus during the trying times in the fasting of the wilderness. And it is love that gathers the angels and all of their love offers protection to Jesus. It is love that Jesus is calling us to, to turn around and to see and to feel and to experience and to share. It is love that fuels the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Love is the central message of our faith. Now, I think back to Gary Char Charles's uh, moment where he probably wished that had just popped into his brain. I wish I would think that all the time as well. Because when we get to love through metanoia, through turning around, through returning to God, through going beyond the mind we have, we find that love is actually everywhere. I believe that love is everywhere. If we only have the perception to see it and to feel it. For example, it's in our texts this morning. In Genesis 9, 8 through 17, God places a bow in the sky as a reminder of the covenant that God has with people. The rainbow sign is a sign of God's love for humanity. Walter Brueggemann writes, the bow is likely not understood in romantic ways, nor with an accent of political pluralism. Rather, it is likely referring to God's bow and arrows as a weapon of war, hostility, and destructiveness. God suspends the bow in the heavens as a gesture of disarmament, as a promise not to be the aggressor or the adversary of humanity ever again. It is God's gesture of love and peace and reconciliation. God intends to be at peace with God's world, recalcitrant though it has been, and the bow is not so much a message for humanity, it is a reminder to God to be faithful and everlasting as God has promised to be. I've been thinking about this. 
if you take that to be the way it is, then I, it's sort of as though the bow, the rainbow, is like God's tabit note in the sky. So, it's a little big, but I put together a note that God may put in the sky. Note to self. Remember to love them today in spite of all the evidence not to. And of course, that's God speaking to God's self. The bow constantly reminds God to remember to be loving to people who are not always remembering to be loving. In 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22, Peter reminds us as followers of Christ to love as completely as he first loved us. Against the opposition of a hostile culture, Jesus walks into Jerusalem armed with gentleness, kindness, reverence, and love, and lays down his life for the life of the world. In total and complete sacrificial love, a love which overcomes principalities and powers, he dies he is laid in the tomb, he rises from the dead, he ascends into heaven, and he lives with the angels in the power of God eternally. Peter reminds us in his letter to always remember this and to maintain a hopeful view of the world in spite of all the evidence to give up. Isn't that essentially what true love looks like? Love perseveres and persists when all else, all other evidence points to giving up and simply laying down and dying. Love lifts us up when there is no logical reason to be raised up. And so we have in both of those texts a pointing to love. And then returning to Mark, we're reminded that love was in the wilderness in the experience that Jesus was going through. While Matthew and Luke's Gospels love to tell a complicated story of Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, you know, the back and forth between Satan and Jesus, Mark isn't interested at all in that. It's almost like Mark doesn't care about temptation. He cares about the wilderness. Mark is focused on the wild work of Jesus and the wild beasts and those wild angels that attend to him there. So if you were in the wilderness and you knew that the wolves were your protectors and the bears were your friends, if you knew that the wildebeests and the scorpions were actually looking out for your best welfare, and if you knew that the rattlesnake and the coyote had your back, you could face all of the heat and cold, all of the temptations of the devil, anything that would come your way. You could take on anything spiritual and physical, knowing that the wild beasts were ministering to you. And then, when the beasts were resting from the scorching noonday sun, if you knew that the spiritual heavy artillery of the angels, probably not the best word, if you knew that the angels were watching over you, and your shoulders were covered, and that they would face all oppression and temptation in the wilderness heat, you could also muster all the courage and strength in the whole wide world to face the devil and anything that he put in your path to trip you up and hurt you. Just like Jesus, you could say, be gone, Satan. And it would roll off your lips with ease and assuredness that such love as this was yours. The God of love who sends the bow as a reminder to God's self to keep peace with people who destroy life with callous disregard. The God of love who sends the wild beasts and angels to protect and defend his beloved son in the wilderness. The God of love who gives us a savior who is gentle and kind and compassionate and unafraid to walk into the heart of darkness and face it out of the love that he has for us. This God of love is willing to give everything for us. This is a God we can trust and we can follow. My friends, 
Love is the central message of our faith. As we learn today and get into love through metanoia, through turning around, through returning to God, through returning with God, and through going beyond the mind we have, we can face all things together in love. So may the wild beasts minister to you this week out of their love for you. And may the angels be on your shoulders, knocking down all the love, lovelessness that comes at you from behind and straight into your face. And may our God of love care for you in ways that you never before imagined possible. Amen.